Please note that today's topic may contain elements that some listeners could find disturbing, so listener caution is advised. Before we get started, I'm super happy and excited I have a very special guest on the show today, Rachel. Rachel, good evening. Good evening. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. I'm good, and thanks very much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. No problem. So Rachel is one of my favourite people generally, but more importantly, she's a true crime geek, just like me, and she regularly needs her fix. So Rachel, why don't you tell us a little bit about why you love true crime so much? Well, my true crime um, passion started way back in the 90s when I first discovered Crime Watch. So I think like many uh, UK true crime addicts, um, that was the, the foundation. And I'm not afraid to say or ashamed to say that the day they announced they were cancelling it, I definitely shed a tear or two. But um, basically, I just think there's something to be said about the mystery and the storytelling with true crime. I can listen to it, watch it, or read about it, and just become fully immersed in it. And I think it helps as an escape for an hour or two of the day. Plus, I'm totally fascinated what, by what drives people to commit the crimes. Um, personally, I'd be shit scared if I ended up in jail. I just couldn't cope with that, Andy. Um, but yeah, I'm just kind of um, intrigued by what 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 are the drivers behind um the the crimes and whether people think about the consequences at that point um and things like that are rarely discussed but uh, i quite like the psychology behind it i get what you're saying as long as you don't actually start committing true crime then then i think we're all God, good no. <laughs> no i would not survive in jail i think that should just be noted <laughs> so so what would be your favorite type of true crime and if you listen to any podcasts which are your favorite ones Yeah, well, like other than the documentaries that are shown on television, which I absolutely love, fully submerge myself in, find myself sometimes becoming some sort of investigator for the FBI, potentially. Um, I do love podcasts. Uh, So, yeah, I'd worked with you for a couple of months before um, I kind of came clean about my love of true crime and I'm not quite sure how we came about discussing the subject but uh, we did start to talk about Serial um, and that was just an epic series and Sarah Koenig absolute legend but then you introduced me to Seeing Red and I'm not gonna lie I that podcast took over my life for about three months so um I, I think I've really immersed myself now in in podcast true crime um over television series uh, seeing red is pretty awesome it's one of my favorites too um so and how we got talking about it I, I imagine it's because I I like to procrastinate and I, I talk about anything other than working the meeting so um <laughs> So great. Uh, shall we get on to what people are waiting for, Rachel? The story. Yeah. Yeah, let's go. Let's go for it. If it's safe for you to do so, I'd like all of you listening to relax. Close your eyes and picture the scene. It's just after 6 p.m. on the 19th of May. It's a Saturday evening in 2018. We're in a leafy, affluent, friendly green small town in Ireland, and it's scary, which is not too far away from its capital city of Dublin. Temperatures were about 70 degrees Celsius, that's about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. It was still daylight, the sun could be felt, but you knew the day was closing and a gentle breeze was blowing by, almost like a soft brush stroking your skin. Can you picture the scene? So, it's nights like this, most people don't remember, but they tend to enjoy the most. Everything seems carefree. You're halfway through the weekend already, and you're either looking forward to spending a night with your friends or loved ones, or alternatively, just a nice unwind and recharging your batteries. So what would you be doing on an early Saturday evening in May, Rachel? Well, can I just say, you have pictured the sea and it sounds absolute bliss. Um, and it, it's a shame of what's to come. But yeah, if it were me, I'm not going to lie, I've got a Saturday night pizza ritual. It doesn't matter where I am or who I'm with, pizza will absolutely be involved. Um, so yeah, that that's me any, any time of year. How about you? Um, Saturday nights, it depends. Normally, I'm just 
I'm just relaxing and, and trying to stay awake nowadays. Now I'm getting a little bit older, but um, in the past, it'd be getting ready to go out. But nowadays, it's just chilling out. I hear you. I hear you. So I'd like to introduce you to Justine. Justine Valdez lived with her mother and father in Enniskerry. She was a 24-year-old woman who was originally from the Philippines, and she moved to Ireland to join her parents just three years earlier in 2015. Her parents, Danilo and Teresita Valdez, had emigrated to Ireland several years earlier to start a new life, a better life for themselves, with the view of bringing Justine over so she could have the best chances in life. All they wanted was for her to be happy. I've personally lived in several countries around the world, coincidentally including the Philippines and Ireland, so I can only imagine what a culture shock it must have been for Justine. It really can't have been easy for her. Justine was described by those that knew her as being around five foot tall, slim, with long dark hair and big beautiful brown eyes. As soon as Justine had joined her family in Ireland, she worked hard towards her own dreams and aspirations. She took up an accountancy course to give herself a good start in life and had two part-time jobs to help support her studies and help her parents. She worked as part-time as a care assistant and also in a local restaurant part-time. She had settled, she'd found a boyfriend that she loved and was looking forward to what life would bring her. Oh, now, woman. She is, she is. Um, I think that she was very level-headed and, um, and focused from what I can, what I can yeah. gather. Yeah. So the Filipino culture is well known for having a close-knit, loving families who look out and care for each other. And the Valdez family was no different. Justine loved her parents and they loved her. She was known to always be grateful and thankful for what they had done and continue to do for her. In fact, if you have the time, have a Google and you can find a letter that Justine actually wrote to her uh, mother and father telling them how much she loved them. Now, when she had gotten her first paycheck in Ireland, the only thing on her mind was to share the good fortune with her family, which is a tradition in the Philippines to spend your first paycheck on food for the family. So she bought food for her family and enjoyed a meal with her parents to celebrate. Now, the day in question, that bright, sunny Saturday in May, was no different for Justine. She had a 2 p.m. appointment at the Bray Garda station. And for those that don't know, the Garda are the Irish police force. So she'd had a 2 p.m. appointment at the police station which was regarding renewing her res residency permit before going to the gym. Justin and her mum, it showed you how close they were. They had exchanged 63 text messages between each other that day. With the last 63? Text I know, that's quite a lot, isn't it? Um, that's impressive. Like, they must have just been chatting crap. <laughs> probably, I imagine, doing what families do the best. And so, yeah, the last of her text messages... Uh, the last contact Justine had with her mum uh, was at 4.20 p.m. And the mum asked her to buy some bread on the way home. As, and Justine said she would. Probably a request that parents ask the kids all the time. So before we go any further, have you heard of this story before, Rach? No, I've not. But I was compelled to do a quick Google search on her name. And I just wanted to comment on how lovely and innocent and perfectly ordinary she looked in her photos like you know it never fails to amaze me actually how ordinary everything seems to be when we talk about these true crime stories and then you think to yourself like oh if something was to happen to me right now and you had to look at my last actions or the last messages I sent um, it would be something like very plain and simple and probably quite embarrassing because you just don't think at that moment that it's your like last opportunity to interact with somebody like I, I just before we came to record this today um, and you can edit it out if you want but I, I'd left my daughter on the toilet and told Lee to make sure he wiped her bum properly like by text message and it's like you know that's perfectly innocent but I would be mortified if that if that was shared on you know national news as the last message I, I sent before um, my untimely demise. But don't worry if if I ever this show ever becomes famous then it's going to be shared with everyone else anyway now. <laughs> But no, I, I know exactly what you're saying because the thing is, what we all strive for in life is to have a normal, peaceful, quiet life. So yeah. 
that is that shows that someone is succeeding if if they're just going about their everyday business and there isn't drama every single yeah. moment of the day. So, yeah. um, so Justine, she would just gotten on the one eighty five bus at five forty p.m., which would have arrived in NSK just a little after six p.m. Now it's just after six. Now Justine, she'd just been to the gym, so she was wearing a gym clothes, which were grey leggings, a white t-shirt trainers and a dark jacket. She just got off the bus in the center of Enniskerry and she started to walk home. It would have been a 15, maybe 20 minute walk. It was a nice gentle walk. And can I, yeah. sorry, can I just ask like in Enniskerry, like and what springs to mind when I was reading this was the Sarah Everard case, you know, and, and she had worn bright colored clothing because she was going to be walking through parks late at night in London but where we have set the scene in Enniskerry is it quite a safe place yeah. like yeah. street lights I mean obviously we're talking about 6 p.m anyway but there's no need for women to be wearing anything that will identify them you know because they're just walking along a safe part of the country right yeah no exactly I mean she would have been walking at some point, if you'd have if you'd have gotten home, and I hope I'm not spoiling the story here, she would have probably walked along one or two country lanes. But no, Enniskerry, it's a very affluent area. It's got some of yeah. the wealthiest people in Ireland either live in there or very very close by there. Including, wow. I think Christy Berg has a house there, and there's a, there's a few famous people around there. So it, okay. it's not. I mean, it's not all affluent, but it is a very desirable place to live. So no, you you'd walk through there. Anyone would, and assume that it was as safe as probably you could get yeah yeah it's where imagine imagine it, it's where you you move out to when you've made a little bit of money from the city yeah yeah starting your family maybe exactly mm-hmm. um so so yeah she just got off the center of bus and she started to walk home it was a nice gentle walk and it was a nice gentle mm-hmm. evening and it was a good way for her to cool off after a hard session in the gym you know, it's like you've you've worked hard and you just want to wind down a little bit. But this is a true crime podcast, so the evening was far from nice for Justine, as on that day, she never made it home. Her mother was immediately worried. Due to the close nature of their relationship, she knew straight away that if anything, absolutely anything, would have stopped her from arriving home on time, she would have told her mum. When we know they exchanged 63 text messages, about a lot of nothing, so she would have definitely told her mum, but she didn't. So where was she? Now, at six ten on the same evening, so just about nine minutes after she had departed from the bus, the Garda, the Irish police, they received a phone call from a worried mother, Susan Forsyth. Uh, she had been driving along with her son on the R seven sixty between Power Scott Estate and Enniskerry when she saw a woman who who it later turned out to be Justine being bundled into a dark Nissan SUV. She oh. ins- I know. It's not what you expect to see when you're driving along the, the road, is it? So no. she immediately pulled over and she dialed 999. And I'm going to quote Susan here. And this is what she had to say about what she witnessed. I saw a car stopped on the road with no lights and no blinkers. The door of the boot was open. Uh, that's a trunk for our American listeners. I heard her shouting. She was sitting at the edge of the boot, looking out at me. I saw an Asian face with dark hair. The shouting turned to screaming. She said, I I heard a deep male voice shouting angrily. I began to feel that there was something very wrong. I can't oh imagine. God. I can't imagine what you'd feel if you witnessed that. Would you? And a son? Yeah. Yeah, I know. It, it's, um, it doesn't even bear thinking about. So uh, the guardie responded to the 999 phone call and they found... At the scene, they found a shopping bag. It was Justine's shopping bag, and it contained a loaf of bread, her mum asked her to buy, and a smash oh. mobile phone. So, at the scene. So, yeah, it was, she had the bread that her mum had asked her, and she was just on her way home to spend the evening with her family. I know, it's, um, it when I first was first reading it, it brought a tear to my eye. Luckily, this is an audio podcast, so um, we, we, I can get away with that. But, before before they could get to the scene, however, before the police could get to the scene, there was another witness, Gareth Thompson, and he would later tell the court that he was leaving Bray 
in the direction of the N11 Dublin to Wexford Road at about 6.20pm, which is about 10 minutes or so after uh, Susan first witnessed witness her abduction and contacted the police. So Gareth ended up being behind the same darkness and SUV. He called the police immediately to report seeing an Asian woman in the back of a black Jeep banging on a window and screaming for help. And this is what he had to say to the court. I noticed a little girl waving. And I assume he probably thought he was a little girl because uh, Justine was quite petite and she had both hands up. She had a concerned look. She was sitting at an angle and it didn't look comfortable. Oh, my God. And he, he'd be the last person to see her alive, right? Yes. Uh, well, yes and no. There was a few other um, sightings of Justine in distress, uh, but there wasn't any discernible quotes that I could use. But it was about four or five different people saw her in distress in the car. Oh, my God. So at this stage, the Guardi, they obviously had credible information that a woman had been abducted, but they did not know if it was a certainty or who the woman was. I don't know why they didn't know that was a certainty. It's not like it would be anything else. But at, um, at 11.20 p.m., her parents couldn't wait no longer. I'm surprised they waited that long personally, but they knew there was no more buses for Justine to arrive home on, so they reported her missing to the police. I'm really surprised it did wait that long. Uh, but they, so, they, the are police, there, sorry. Are there, are there laws in Ireland, like there are in the UK, where you have to wait, like, 24 hours for some, for an adult yeah. to be missing? There are. There are, but I think in this situation, when they reported her, and they already had the yeah, they should, reports they about have. the abduction, so, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. Not they yet. immediately put the pieces together and they began to fear that it was Justine. So I just want to ask your thoughts on this, Rach. Can you comprehend the fear that she must have been feeling? What she must have felt like being not only abducted, but being trapped in that car and being driven to, to where you don't know and to what you don't know? I mean, I think that this is part of the fascination with true crime is you immerse yourself in seeing the victim's last movements and trying to feel or believe what they felt or thought um, in those moments that, that were leading up to the crime taking place. And this particular one is so rare because you've got a live account of the victim being abducted. Like usually it takes, you know, a couple of hours maybe, if not days for people to come forward and say, oh, I saw this dodgy thing and I didn't think anything of it, but the, the abductor has behaved so erratically in the open that like these guys and kudos to them they've called 999 and in a really calm manner just kind of reported the crime and the guardian has been able to get get on it so quickly but in in terms of her moments like I can't imagine you know what she, the panic and the 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 idea of just needing to capture someone's attention and, and need to be saved, like, because she wouldn't have had any idea what was coming. Exactly. And when you say the guard, he got on it immediately. They, they knew about it, but one of the, I haven't, I wasn't going to talk about this today, but one of the recommendations that the coroner put forward was that they had a, they created a centralized communication channel uh, between different areas of the, the police because they didn't have that. And that was one of the things which led to a few delays and him possibly they possibly stopping him while she was still in the car so wow. um, so they knew about it but yeah no it wasn't it wasn't a perfect response so I, i'm glad you you talk about the abductor i know we haven't mentioned him yet but what type of person do you think could do this oh a batshit crazy one <laughs> like honestly like what on earth would possess someone to just take another human being under normal circumstances but to do it at the side of a road like and bundle them in the back of your car you've not even again you know I don't want to go back to just one case but it's a case that springs to mind you've got Sarah Everard and you've got a man that pulls up alongside her and obviously in some way shape or form asks her to get in the car maybe it's for a lift he might have flashed his badge because he's he was you know in the force 
you can kind of comprehend that she might have volunteer voluntarily got in his car. Therefore, there's not been a public, you know, emergency because no one's seen anything unsuspecting. But this guy has literally just picked this petite woman up and bundled her into the back of his car. He he can't be well, like in terms of his his thinking, you know, there's no, no. common sense there. No. Uh, either he can't be well or, or he's a psychopath, one of the two. Yeah, yeah, well that, I agree. So I'd like to now just take a step back and I'd like to introduce you to Mark Hennessy. Mark was a 41-year-old father of two daughters and he worked as a builder. At the time when this happened, he lived in Bray, which is a coastal town in County Wicklow. It's not far from Enniscary and again, it is a reasonably affluent area, but he was originally from Ballybrack in County Dublin. It was from a large council estate, not that that had any anything to do with this. So Mark, he had previ- three previous convictions to his name. He was he had a possession of cannabis back in 1999, um, which he would have been about 19 at the time. He And the following year when he was 20, he had two separate convictions for threatening and abusive behavior and being intoxicated in the public area. He received fines for all three offences. I imagine they were all quite minor. And at the time of Justin's abduction, he was currently on bail, charged with drink driving, crashing into other vehicles, and leaving a collision scene. Mark was described generally as being a quiet man, a thoughtful and polite person. But was he? Do you think he was? Standard. Was Was that just a front, or do you think he was actually this quiet, thoughtful and polite person? Well, these people are hiding their secrets behind, you know, the acts of being thoughtful and kind and, you know, good human being, good member of the community. Um, but, you know, you, you, you mentioned there something that happens again and again and again. Not that anybody could have preempted it, but the man was on bail because he'd been, be- because of his behavior. Yeah, he broke the law. Like, why Why was he bailed? If he hadn't have been bailed, he would be in prison um, awaiting the case. And, you know, I, I've not done any research into the law, um, but here I just think there are so many instances where men, women should be locked up for previous crimes and are out in the, in the community doing batshit crazy things and you know they get away with it or sorry they they commit further crimes and um it's just you know it shouldn't shouldn't have happened i just think this is senseless yeah no i i I can see what you're saying i mean that's a whole other pod to talk about that just to give you (laughs) give you a bit of context in the uk and ireland you're only remanded which means you're only sent to jail waiting for your your sentencing or trial if a prison sentence is inevitable or you, they deem you being so if you've pled guilty in a prison sentence you're going to receive you'll be remanded before you uh before the before the trial is finished or if you're deemed a danger to society so so i'm guessing drink driving crashing into other vehicles and then driving off from the scene it's it's deemed as being a minor offense so that's probably okay. why he wasn't on remand I'm not saying he should or shouldn't have been, but that would have been the thinking behind it. So, so, so a close neighbour of Mark, they described him as being a very, very quiet man who was terribly nice. She went on to say this about him. He was only in the area a couple of years. He had two little girls. I am on my own, and he was the only one who came in to check on me when the real bad snow hit. He knocked in several times, and asked if I was okay and needed anything from the shop. He was a really nice neighbour. When he moved in, he couldn't have been nicer. He asked me would I hold his key for him in case anything happened, if the alarm went off or anything like that. His wife was always walking around, and she's a really nice girl. So it backs up what you were saying. This is a family man. He had children. He had a good job, a good house. A He was in a loving relationship. And so Mark, he was seemingly doing well in life. Um, And in September of 2017, the year before, 
he'd bought himself a new car, a black Nissan cash key SUV type vehicle, which obviously we know that Justine was abducted by a Nissan SUV vehicle. And there's actually a video online, believe it or not, the moment Mark bought his black Nissan SUV because it was taken by the car dealer to promote the dealership. Now, I can't share the video on my social medias for copyright reasons, but quick, quick Google or internet search and you could be able to watch it. But Mark is quoted as saying in this video about his new car, absolutely beautiful now. It drives really well. I'm delighted with it. The staff have treated me very well and as well, so delighted with me by. Now, um, unfortunately, if it would have been a crappy car, maybe it would have broke down, but it, it obviously did drive well. Uh, so I don't think I'm ruining anything by saying that it was Mark driving the car that abducted Justine. So I want to fast forward to that Saturday. It was around 7 a.m. in the morning and Mark went to work. He returned home just after 3 p.m. At 5.25 p.m., so less than an hour before he abducted Justin, he would leave his home, telling his wife that he was off to the pub for a drink with his friends. So a normal Saturday evening for most people up and down the country. So CCTV from the pub would show him leaving the pub at 5.41 p.m. And he appeared to be on the phone to someone and he left the car park in his car two minutes later. A CCTV from the bus Justine was on will later confirm that he was driving behind the bus shortly before Justine departed from the bus. So, and skipping forward a few hours, later that evening, that Saturday evening at about 11 p.m., Mark returned to the pub and he carried on drinking with his friends for a few no. hours. So yes, he was. It was normal, and there was no. He was alone. Oh there my was no, no, no sign. No sign of Justine, and he just. It was like he'd just nipped out, and he'd just return be- back and just having a few drinks with his friends. Yeah, like he'd had his fix. Like it was all premeditated, and he he headed off, did what he did, came back, felt calm. Yeah. What a, yeah, he- what a psycho. You can say that. So the question has to be asked, where had he been between abducting Justine and then going back to the pub at 11 p.m.? And mm-hmm. how could he just casually go back to the pub as if nothing had happened? Like you said, uh, was he a psychopath? Quite possibly. And so he was already back in the pub and he'd already been drinking for 20 minutes. So I just want you to think about that. He'd already been drinking for 20 minutes, laughing with his friends, and again, if you go online, you can actually see a video of him in a pub laughing and joking with his friends. Oh and uh, so he was drinking for 20 minutes before Justin's parents reported him missing. So just think about those two contrasting emotions. He was just laughing and having fun. And they was there at home, worried about their daughter being missing. So in a strange country. Yes. So it was around 3 a.m. on the, early on a Sunday morning that the guardy identified that Mark was a man who was driving the car and Justine was a woman he had abducted. Uh, so by this time, no one knew he, where he was though because the pub had closed. So on a Sunday morning, on the 20th, the guardy, they held a press conference appealing for information to trace the whereabouts of Justine and they released... They actually didn't release this in the morning, they released it in the afternoon, but they released the information on the car that they were seeking. But they they didn't identify Mark as being a prime suspect, just that the, the type of car that they were looking for with a partial number plate. So it was late it would later transpire that at 3 31 pm, that's quite accurate, but at 3 31 pm on that Sunday, Mark would meet with some of his family members in a car park in Kaleni. And he was alone at the time when he met with them. And after he had met with them, the family passed this information on to the guardee. So I was thinking about this. So by this time, his family and friends knew that the police were looking for him. Mark knew that they were looking for him. They agreed to meet him. And they they only told the police afterwards. Yeah, that's out of order. And do you you think he confessed to them? Uh, Well, he did. He did phone his um he did phone his wife to tell her that he, he would not see him again. So if he phoned his wife to tell her that, 
I imagine he probably would have said something to his family members. But we don't know. They never they never said what they spoke about. But yeah, mm-hmm. you, you'd, you'd think that he would do. Because they, they would be the first question they would ask him. What's yeah. going on? What is going on, yeah. Have you got anything to do with this? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so later on, at 8 p.m. that day, a woman would identify Mark's car and then follow it to a car park. And they would inform the police that they, they were following it. And the guardie, so the guardie would arrive at the scene, the car park where Mark was parked in. And a few minutes later, Mark would be shot twice, once in the arm and once in the head. And, and this is oh. actually quite a serious thing in Ireland. It's, it's not often the police turn up with guns and it's not often people end up dying. Yeah. So he was pronounced dead at 8.38 p.m. So just a little over 26 hours after Justine was abducted. So there was actually witnesses to this because the car park was in a place that had apartments nearby and office buildings. So uh, the witness and Andrew Rogers would later say this to the inquest. I recall the guardie was trying to open the door. They were shouting, open the door. And another voice said, smash the window. I saw a guard raise a karate kick at the driver's window, but it did not break. The driver looked as if he knew everything was over for him. He took a blade about 10 centimeters long and he cut it from his left wrist to the elbow in one single slicing motion. So I think so he was going to die, like regardless yes. of whether they shot him, that was his end game. I think so. Yeah. So it would, it would be reported by the guard on the scene and the guard that shot him that Mark was self harming. He was cutting his wrists, as we've just heard, and he was also cutting his neck. Now the guard, oh. God. He had feared Justine was in the car at the time. So that's yeah. why he shot and killed him to try and prevent the loss of life to Justine. Yeah. Now, but Justine wasn't in the car. And it's worth noting because a lot of the times you hear on podcasts, and I'm no doubt I'll say this in the future, there's a lot of mistakes by the police. It's worth noting that the guard who was involved, they was absolved of any wrongdoing at the inquest. He acted within all correct guidelines, and even Mark's family came out and said the guard did the right thing. So, well, yeah, most of the time, the police don't want to cause any harm to the criminal because they want to convict them, and obviously, otherwise, they could be sued, or you know, like you say, they could be investigated for wrongdoing. So, you find that loads of times, like that, they don't even want to. I think you said that they shot him in the arm loads of times they don't even want to shoot to to maim do they because they don't want to risk massive injury and therefore yeah. not getting a conviction that's their key isn't it in these instances yeah and I think sometimes we forget about the person actually doing the shooting so even though it's in the line of duty I think it must be so difficult don't you Rachel just to take someone's life like that to know that you've ended someone's life I don't know if I could do that oh yeah and like Again, you see a lot of the time in America, you know, people come forward with these situations um, where they are uh, kind of on um, leave from their duties because of PTSD from from acting in a line of defense and and um, and causing like fatal injury to criminals. Um, And you just think, well, you. You did everything right, but yeah, they just can't get over it, can they? Because they've taken a life, and um, I mean, exactly. it depends where you, it depends where you sit on that, um, that like spectrum of whether you're acting in defence or, or you know, regardless. Like I personally don't believe in the death sentence because I think even if you take someone's life, taking the criminal's life, it's not an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. No, you're just causing more pain. And anguish albeit it annoys me no end the amount of money that is spent on housing criminals you know in prisons and keeping them fed and watered because certainly some of the really rare criminals that have committed awful crimes i you know that frustrates me but i also don't believe that we should you know have the death penalty so no, i fully agree i feel the death penalty it's it's a sad reflection on society that people should want death yeah. people. Um, yeah. You're not punishing someone by killing them because 
you end in their life. But anyway, again, that's that's probably another hour or two of podcast. So <laughs> I, I won't I won't go down there. Um, one thing I've just realised while talking to you that I can't nod in agreement when I'm talking to you because um, nods aren't recorded, are they? So, um, no. so I just not that people want to hear that, but I've just realised I was I was sat here nodding nodding at you, and I realised that it wasn't doing much good. So so after. After Mark had been killed, let me get back online here. Yeah. So after Mark had been killed, there was a bloodstained note that was found in his car and it only had three words on it. And those words were Puck's Castle and Sorry. Oh so my God. they were able to download the sat nav data from his car. And along with the note, they started to search near a place called Puck's Castle, which is in Rathmichael in South Dublin. Right. And yeah, sorry. He, he obviously had some sort of remorse. There's obviously some sort of human yeah. bone emotion I in his a, body. Yeah, I have a thing about this one. It really annoys me because when you, a lot of the times when people are saying sorry, they say sorry and show remorse because they've been caught. Yeah, yeah. Not because exactly. they've actually done something. So it, it's, oh, yeah. I, I always think it's a little bit false. They want to relieve their conscience, right? Yeah. 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 So not I, so well I done. Yeah, it's it's um it's one of my bugbearers. So But at yeah. the same time, how many people have gone to the grave with secrets, you know, of of knowing, you know, um Myra Hindley and um you know the situation and, and the power that um that she held yeah. um or holds with with the, the knowledge that she has on those girls. But yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Yeah, no, I, I see what you're saying. Um, Annie and Brady, not just Myra Hindley, sorry. Yeah, um, of course, but, but she's yeah. still alive, I think, and he's obviously not. Yeah, exactly. She's still alive or is she dead? She is still alive, I think. Um, maybe just don't publish the date that you um, publicised this podcast and we could just claim it was years ago. But <laughs> um, yeah. but no, he, went, he, he committed suicide in jail, but I have always thought that she pulled the strings in that relationship. I do believe that he was a criminal and was inappropriate with children, but I think it escalated when he met her because she she was essentially, you know, coordinating and helping and trapping a lot more victims. So that's why I say she knows about a lot more because I think he was under her spell. Quite possibly. I have to admit it's not something... It's not something I've looked into, those no. two. Um, so I don't know much about them other than obviously what You could go did. down a rabbit hole. like That's the problem I have sometimes. It, hours go by and you realise that you just took down various different yeah. links and wiki pages. But um, I don't want to... So, sorry. Uh, so let me... Where was I? So uh, they started to search near Puck's Castle with Ralph Michael, which is in South Dublin. And at around 3.30pm on Monday, so the next day, Justine's body was found in dense gorge. Dense gorge. I can't say that. Um, I probably won't edit that out because I can't pronounce it anyway. But she had been strangled to death. Now I don't want to go into any more detail about how she died. It's gruesome enough, and I don't think it's needed. If you really want to know, get on your phone and Google. So, but Justine's parents, they were quoted as saying, saying this. And just before I get onto this, I'm going off script a little bit. What I think speaks volumes about them is Mark's parents approached them at Justine's uh, memorial a uh, year, a couple of years later, and this year actually, and they try to apologise on Mark's behalf, and it shows you the quality of people they are because they said to the well, her mother, his mother, sorry, they said to her that you don't have to apologise for him. This is not your fault you've done nothing wrong and the strength that must have took because his parents were obviously feeling very guilty yeah and you you normally want to just put the blame on people straight away but they were big enough to say look this is not your fault you don't need to feel guilty about this you don't need to apologize and i i, I think that's commendable you that's something which not many people would be able to do um, oh absolutely and they're obviously you know, deeply religious or spiritual because you only get that kind of forgiveness and um, what's what's the word? Compassion 
um, through the loss of a child when you can see through somebody else's eyes and obviously although their son was a killer they have lost their son as well so to be able to share that compassion and say you know you absolutely have nothing to apologize for that's massive definitely i was sat here nodding again but yeah definitely <laughs> um so so justine's parents um were quoted as saying this at the time we will never know why this happened we will never understand how such evil can exist in the, the world our grief will never pass the loss of our beautiful justine will never fade we will never have peace now joseph squire he was the the chap who had been dating justine since november of 2017 he described her as happy and active and he said she was always happy she was always active she never got up to any mischief and like you said you can tell that by looking at her yeah she he had he added that she never took drugs he said this she was literally the most innocent person i have ever met in my life and i will never forget her you can tell that the wholesome element like you know 63 messages to your mom on a saturday going to the gym going and renewing your license you know you're not you're not going to get your nails done and your hair done ready to go on a night out like yeah definitely. at 24 definitely so three years later it is this year actually to mark the three years since her death justine's mother teresita she told a newspaper newspaper that she still cannot cope with the unbearable loss Again, I can't imagine. And she actually wrote a letter to her daughter. So I think it's appropriate if I probably finish off by reading this letter. And it, it, it goes as follows. It's been three years since you passed away, Justin, Gerald, and Ack. There is no shortcut in getting over our grief of losing you. There is no magic cure to make all the heart, work, heart There is no magic cure to make all the heartache go away forever without you, Gerald. Many times it is so unbearable to cope. We are trying hard to get by, but it, it has become a ritual for me to break down and cry just to ease the heartache and the longing for you, my dear princess. Missing you has been part of our daily life. There are so many memories and things that remind me of you and they hurt so much. We live our lives one day at a time. Only God knows how hurtful and painful it is for us to come to terms with what happened. My heart aches and longs for you, my dear child. May God's grace and mercy give me the courage to face and be at peace knowing that you are already in heaven above. I will forever be missing you, Gerald. I will forever be wanting your presence and I can't help but think, what if? Perhaps the joy and contentment in life is only to have you back with me. But I know the Lord loves you more than I do. That's the only reason I can think properly. So, rest in peace, my dear child. We will always be loving you, forever be missing you, and keeping you in a heart that is broken in pieces. So that's that's every time I read that, and I've read that a few times preparing for today. That I well up when I'm reading that. How how touching is that, Rachel? That is um, that is from the heart. Yeah, yeah. and actually, when you shared the script, I couldn't bring myself to read that I have a five-year-old and um yeah I just no words will do justice what um I feel like that woman must be going through um the the case just blows my mind on this one and you could lose yourself you could drive yourself crazy trying to figure out the why and the how and then just that's just on the case itself but then you think of the people that are left behind her poor parents his poor wife and that poor girl like and his children he had two daughters yeah two young daughters yeah absolutely like you know oh god I, I i didn't even think about that though andy but yeah, to, to be raised and, you know, obviously you've already said it's a close-knit community. They're going to know that their dad did something and that's not going to leave them. And No, God, well, it's just... uh, in fact, his his wife, she was British apparently, and his wife had to leave Ireland and take her kids back to the UK with her because she couldn't be there anymore. So 
her life's destroyed because her yeah. job's gone, her home is gone, and she's having to explain to her children what happened to the dad. You can't. How can you? If if your if a parent died, it'd be natural as the other parent to fill your children full of happy memories of that parent. Yeah. But how can you do that if you know what he's just done? You exactly. can't do that. The the whole thing is senseless. Like, and sometimes, right when you when you come across cases of true crime, you hear that it was a crime of passion. It was in the heat of the moment. The killer was someone they knew. You know, there's a case that makes you roll your eyes and go, "Oh, okay." You know, yeah, get it. There's there's been you know, um, I don't know, a situation that has escalated or something that's been building that has caused, you know, the crime, whatever that is. This man was in his car on the way to the pub or leaving the pub, whatever. Um, it, like, by all accounts, it, it's it's just awful luck that that woman got on that bus that got off at the time that he was driving past. Like, yeah. the whole thing is senseless. The whole thing. Yeah. There's no premeditation in it. And everyone will suffer for the rest of their lives that's been touched by this case without any cause. And he's no longer suffering. And he should be the one suffering for this. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. Definitely. So, with that, for one last time today, I'd like you all to relax. I'd like you to close your eyes and picture the scene. It's a warm, balmy Saturday evening in May. The contentment of a happy life and a future of hope and excitement lay ahead. How do you feel? Now, I want you to imagine how Jassine would have been feeling. And keep that in your minds. So, I want to thank you for joining me, Rach. I am extremely grateful. I I really wanted to, to have you on, on the show. So I'm um, hopefully you'll be back in the future. And if you want to be, you're always welcome. Um, and for all of you out there, I'm just starting off. So all feedback is greatly appreciated. Give me a like, give me a follow, give me constructive or positive feedback and give me a subscribe to me and tell your friends if you, if you enjoyed it, that is. And hopefully you did. And we are available on all of the major podcast platforms. So give me a search. Although if you're listening to this, you probably found me already. Picture the Scene Podcast on Instagram and Twitter. I can be found under at ScenePod. That's at S-C-E-N-E-P-O-D. And on Facebook at Picture the Scene Podcast. And why not come and join me in a discussion group at the moment? I'm just talking to myself. But at the time of recording, uh, hopefully... That will be different soon. And it can be found by searching in Facebook, Picture the Scene Podcast Discussion Group. So thank you, Rachel. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And and God bless. And, and goodbye, Rachel. Thanks.